which is a kind of an introduction. It, well, it may be interesting if, if, I don't know how many of you are familiar with comics, how many of you have read comics? It could be Chasha Chaudhary, it could be Tintin, it could be whatever. Yes. So, all of us are familiar with the combination of uh, text and words, text and images, words and pictures. So, uh, okay, let's start off. Let's start by checking your vision first. Very important. Okay, can people in the back see this? Can everybody see this? What do you think? Can anyone see any pattern in this? A dog eating something. Okay, very good. Full points to team A. Anyone else? A dog, yeah, okay. That's very good. So that's just, there's nothing there. It's just your brain's making up stuff. So most people see a Dalmatian. Uh, so, yeah, anyway, I just want to te check whether everybody can see it. So, yeah. uh, this is Fabian, okay. and this is Jay. Uh, sorry, uh -huh. <laughs> I was actually supposed to introduce them. <laughs> I, I, I don't need no introduction, but I'm just joking. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's fine. So, uh, as he said, they'll be taking us through, you know, what we were so used to, the Amar Chitra Kathas type. And uh, Fabian would be doing the drawing. And uh, Jay would be talking about that drawing. And it's inventing the city. It's actually a joint venture between Hamburg and the Goethe Centrum. Uh, they have taken this up. Yes, Jay, please. Yeah, thank you so much. It's and OK, so now I'm going to show you something. I suppose almost all of you are familiar with this. So this is. You know, the, really, you can't get something more important, something that can save your life. Well, very few of us actually bother to read it or listen to the air horses demonstrating, but whatever it is, the whole point is that purely through images, you have to give life-saving information to people without, who come from very different cultural backgrounds. So you have to find images which, to all cultures and is very easily understood and you know, describes actions which can be performed in an emergency. So it's extremely important, and there can be no text. It has to be images, right? OK, so that's just pure images. What happens if you add text to the images? I'm reasonably certain that this is not the meaning that maybe the people who designed the, you know, the airline safety images. So you can see that if you add text to images, you can sort of support the meaning, or you can sort of uh, you know, in interfere with that meaning. So this tension between text and images is what really drives comics. Feel free to laugh heartily if you feel like. Okay. Well, I think the image kind of got, but okay, you can figure it out. The credits are not there. Uh, so I think I am extremely clumsy. I don't think it'll just topple over if I do it. But I think it's okay. I think we're, we're so far so good. Now, here if you notice, it's the same image. Here what has happened, the image has stayed the same and the uh, text changes. This is from an Indian webcomic series done by uh, Aarti Parthasarthi and Chaitanya Krishnan. Uh, well, you can't read it, but it doesn't matter. It's a, it's, a, it's a joke. But the point here is, by having the same image and having different text, it creates the illusion of motion. You feel that the rider is traveling forward, even though the image is exactly the same. And then there's a very crucial pause here, this empty panel. Before the punchline of the joke is here, and this is the empty panel. And that is, that's what gives a sense of time. You feel that time has elapsed. The rider is going forward, he's thinking something which you kind of read. Then there's a pause, he keeps moving forward, and then the punchline. But just using exactly the same image. Again, this is uh, you know, a way in which it used to, uh, you, you manipulate meaning through it. So yeah, so comics, whether you call them chitra kada, sequential narratives, Whatever it is. Uh, is it clearly legible? I think part of it has got chopped off. But anyway, let's see how it goes. So yeah, so this has been around with human history for like uh, 40,000 or 60,000 years. Uh, these are actually images from different parts of the world. But they all speak of the same thing. Uh, for example, one of the theories behind why you know, cave paintings happened was because People drew what they feared and what they wanted. They wanted to hunt mammoths, and they didn't want to get killed by saber-toothed tigers. So by drawing them, they felt that they could control the outcome. 
So by drawing something, they felt that they could control it. By having an image in front of them, they could control reality. So this connection between reality and images also is extremely old. We feel that they are somehow linked. Well, I don't know if it's, the image is not the highest quality. It was taken by, I think, a friend of mine in uh, Brussels. So this is another example of drawing on walls. Uh, I don't know if you can make out the images drawn on the wall, uh, like here. So all of that is, a, is an illusion, obviously. Uh, the door, the windows, even the drain pipe, everything has been drawn onto the walls. Now in this case, this is something drawn on the ceilings in Lepakshi, uh, where people who are waiting for the darshan, uh, they have, you know, there's no, there was no WhatsApp or, you know, forwards to entertain them. So they would look at the ceiling, and the entire ceiling would have these uh, stories from the myths drawn. So as people went on the queue, the queue would be like in a, in a S shape. The images, they would follow the images, and the story would end just before the sanctum sanctorum. And this is more than a thousand years old. So this idea of, you know, entertaining people through stories was there. This is, of course, from uh, Telangana, the Cheriel scroll painting, in which the, the artist would, instead of having text on the... Uh, images, he would recite the story. So, in other cultures ha have a very strong, uh, you know, vocal tradition which people spoke or, or, or sang. So, the text here would be in the form of something spoken. Uh, this is something called the Morgan Bible. So, these Bibles were drawn for rich but illiterate kings in Europe. So, the kings would have the Bibles purely in uh, in picture format and the priest would sort of uh, explain the story, what is happening. So again, this is an idea, like, you know, you can call it a primitive graphic novel if you want. And you can see some text in, uh, in Farsi. Uh, so this was gifted to the, the, I think, Shah Abbas, the Iranian king. And he obviously was very literate. So he was like, I just want, I don't want pictures, I want some text. So the text was added hundreds of years later. So, you know, it kind of, a graphic novel, you can call it a proto-graphic novel if you want. This is something from a Jain, uh, the life of a Jain monk called Suracharya. Uh, now, I, it's about a, basically it's about a teacher who keeps beating up his students, and they gift him, and he keeps breaking the stick. So they finally gift him an iron rod, uh, so that you know he can whack them even more. So I don't know what the moral of the story is, but I'd like you to see, notice that. Can you see these pillars here? So why do why do you think those pillars are there in that picture? Sorry? Yes, exactly. So this idea of separating one image into many images was also there right in the beginning. Even that Lepakshi painting, there were no pillars, but they, were, they used some kind of decorations to sort of separate it. So the idea, you take one image and then you break that image into several images, which all come together to speak uh, and you know, convey one uh, piece of information, was there again right from the beginning. This is actually from the Yusufa in Dargah. You can buy these posters outside that. Uh, near Nampali. So here they've used prayer beads as the as a separation mechanism. So you can be prayer, you know, it can be prayer beads, it can be pillars, whatever it is. Uh, but that's, you know, that's one way of doing it. Now I'll show you something very interesting. This is uh, by a Himachal, a very famous Himachali painter called Nain Sukh. And it's called the Death of Wali. Now all of you are familiar with the legend of uh, Wali and uh, how he fights Sugriva and gets killed by Lord Ram. But the point here is that Wali is never shown here. What is shown is Sugriva meeting uh, Rama uh, and so on. Basically all the events that led to his death. And finally his uh, funeral pyre and the grieving monkeys. So the death of Wali without Wali. Everything that leads, so everything that led to his death is shown. And if you notice, can you see these hills here? These so these hills are used to break up the image instead of pillars. Uh, so again, it's a very sophisticated use. You say the painting is about the death of Wali, but you never show Wali. You show everything. So time is now being broken up. So things which took place over many years or many months have been broken up, and they come together in one image. So again, it's a very sophisticated use of uh, using, uh, using well, comics or whatever you call it, sequential narratives. Now, as far as the form is concerned, I mean, this is basically how it, how it looks. You have a speech bubble, you have a very important thing called the gutter space, which I'll explain, panels and so on. This is a standard American or European or Western format. 
very standard. You can have, you could, it could be Superman. It could be uh, Akbar and Birbal. I'm pretty sure all of you have recognized immediately from the style that this is from Machitra Kada. It's a very distinct style. But okay, you can actually do a lot. This is, it seems very simple, right? A bunch of lines, you break up a page, you put panels, and it doesn't seem very sophisticated. Actually, you can do, there's an infinity of things you can do. So, I don't know if it's very clearly legible, but uh, can you make out? This is actually by an Iranian artist. So can anyone describe what happened here? Yeah, so he is a square or a whatever. So he reads a book about circles, and then he kind of, his mind is changed. And then he realizes that these panels, themselves are actually his, like a jail. They're imprisoning him. Uh, so he kind of, until then, he's unaware that he is a figure in this panel. But then he comes out and he's now suddenly, he's, you know, he's kind of stepped outside the comic and he's now gripping the panel boundaries. So he's kind of realized the nature of reality, if you like. So this is the way in which you can play with the form. You can play with the scale. Uh, I'm sorry, the second part is gone, but... Uh, yeah, anyway, basically here you, it plays with the scale of the, of the image. Or you can also again play with, uh, with time. Well, I'm sorry, this also is slightly affected. But yeah, okay, this is, this you can, you can play with the text as well. Yeah, so you, yeah, as I said, there are like oh, infinite forms you can do. Just using this very basic combination of uh, panels and, and text. Then, uh, how are we placed for time, by the way? What's the time now? Okay, so then we'll just, uh, well, there are lots of very interesting stuff about mechanics, which we won't go into, because I think Fabian is going to actually do something quite interesting. Normally, you have book readings, but uh, how do you do a book reading for a graphic novel? That's, that's the challenge. So, yeah, so let's just uh, go there directly. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, the reason why I'm here is because Jai and me, we did a comic book together, which uh, this is the German cover, Die Unterirdischen Städte. In English, it's called The Cities Beneath. And um, it was published in November last year in Germany, in German. And um, now the English version has come out um, now. And I'll just read you some scenes from our uh, collaboration. So. The whole earth was empty, having only the children and the old left at home, in consequence of that colossal army. Both armies, filled with joy, stood addressed for battle like two agitated oceans. That wide and unparalleled encampment of the vase host, those well-armed and broad-chested warriors, the world resounded with leonine roars and twang of bows and diverse other kinds of noise. Indeed, after the fall of the foremost one of the Bharata's race, the Kuru host looked like the firmament divested of stars, or like the sky without the atmosphere. Or like the earth with blasted crops. Vaheguru, Har Har Mahadev. Or like an oration disfigured by bad grammar. Innumerable weapons still retained in the grasp of the soldiers seemed in their pendant attitude to resemble falling meteors in the sky. The field, O monarch, indented with the hoofs of war horses, looked like a beautiful woman bearing the marks of her lover's nails on her skin. The warriors were cut in twain as if they were seasoned stalks. The earth became strewn with the fallen bodies of the foremost of men and steeds and elephants. Who that strikes a blow is not struck in return? There is also another war, a hidden war. The war underground. This is a struggle of sap and trench, of mine and countermine. 
Hey, you, Major Saab, what is that? Sir, nothing, sir. I hope for your sake it isn't that wretched Gadar. Oh, no, sir. Those Zeppelins have dropping pamphlets again. I'll bloody Latkao anyone who picks them up. What is this rubbish? Nothing, sir. Just one of our gods. I keep the picture for good luck. Honorable Sahib, it is his habit. He's very superstitious. He believes in anything and everything. Huh. As long as it isn't the Wolf Bureau. Now all of you stand to. Ji Sahib. My craft cannot be stopped. I will escape. Was machen Sie für Sachen? Was machen Sie für Sachen? Get outside now. The demolition charges have to be laid. What is all this trash? Well, a book is the best comrade, sir. Not these kinds of books. Confound your insolence. Now get moving. Blow up that spire and on the double. Surely we want God on our side, sir. Don't cough. The spire will be used by the enemy as identification for their artillery once our attack starts. It has to go. Come, you men. Come, you mud gluttons, you foot shufflers, you gravel grinders. Well, lads, now you know why they say every man for himself and God against all. I thought you were a socialist and didn't believe in all this. Jenkins! Yes, sir! Just as I thought. An attack is imminent. Those tank men better be ready and get the moles to hurry up. They are already below, sir, digging away. Fertig machen! Digging sounds have been heard in the listening galley. Right. You and you and you. Go down at once, dig through the galley and cut the fuse. Or blow the charge before they do. Man, this is a suicide mission. Hey, basalt head, you'll feel right at home when the tunnel drops. Come on, guys, everything has to end, even a sausage. Oh, bye, kamerad. Anyone else alive on your side? Couldn't see, there was too much smoke. And yours? Same here, we need to get out. Do you know where this tunnel goes? It's a maze out here. I don't recognize this chamber, though. Looks like it is going to collapse any moment. Let's just run. You speak truly, China. Did your side dig this? This deep? I don't know. But look at the lights. Our tunnels don't have electricity. The lamps are ours. But see, these carvings look so much older. Strange, as if two tunnels are merging. Look, a corpse forest. The soil is loose here? Yes, the bodies are sinking through the clay. Mein Gott. Hey, Bhagwan. These bones look chewed? Ah! What's that sound? Mother. Grab whatever weapon you can. Our best weapon, my friend, is light. Let them have it. God is definitely not with us. I am the bard known far and wide, the traveled rat catcher beside. A man most needful to this town, so glorious through its own renown. However many rats I see, 
how many of them there may be. I cleanse the place from everyone. It is getting dark. They are too many. Where are they? I think I know, but it is too fantastic. We've had so many soldiers missing, so this is it, what has been happening. Same here. They've been dragging away the injured soldiers after every battle. How did they get so big? Fattening on the dead, and for them every day must be a feast. Maybe the poison gas affected them somehow, changed them. Better load up your ammo. I have a feeling we are going to see more danger ahead. See, they almost have arms, as if they are evolving. After eating 900 rats, the cat went on Hajj. Baba! Yeah, so, anyway, so that was a an excerpt from uh, The Cities Beneath, which, uh, yeah, it's, I think uh, it, it came out in German and now it's in English as well. So the, I mean, to just give an example, some of the quotations you hear in the beginning uh, when the World War, it's a scene set in World War One, are actually, the lines are from the Mahabharata describing the Kurukshetra. But of course, I kind of modified the lines and I took them out of context. Uh, so again, you have the lines from the Kurukshetra, but they actually go very well with the First World War as well. Uh, similarly, in the fight with the in the those giant rats, uh, they're actually from a poem by Goethe. So again, you have that's from a German uh, poem, which is about the Pied Piper of Hamelin. So we kind of took these sort of uh, different texts and kind of merged them with different kind of images, and we created some. Hopefully, we created something new. So now we're going to try, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, a live drawing. Let's see how that goes. And then we'll have a small Q&A. Uh, so while that being set up, I can just mention about the project. So the whole project actually is built on something uh, which started when, I think many years ago, I was taking, uh, I was in an auto, and the metro was just being built. So the pillars had just come up. This is right in the beginning. So the auto driver asked me, what are these pillars for? So I said, it's for the metro. So he said, what's that? I said, it's like a flyover, for, but for trains. He said, yeah, okay, that makes sense. And then he was like, but why are they you know, above? Why can't they be under the ground? Um, and then he answered his own question. He said, yeah, of course, you can't do it because that will disturb the, you know, the beings who live beneath the ground. So I was quite interested. I mean, that somehow it struck a chord. And the idea of this tunnel mania is there. It's very old in uh, Hyderabad. I think this school itself has some uh, connection. They found um, a t tunnel here, I think about five years ago, or something like that, a treasure tunnel. So, so yeah, so anyway, so the idea of tunnels under Hyderabad is a very old thing. Uh, and m the way I connected this with, uh, you know, that World War One scene is, a lot of Indian soldiers actually fought in World War One in France. Uh, many of them had never left India. Many of them had no idea where they were going. So when they went to France, it was a completely, it's like, you know, being dropped onto an alien planet. The cold, the rain, the language, and they're fighting, you know, like the elite units of the German army. So they're being, from one moment they're in Secunderabad, and the next moment they're fighting somewhere in France uh, in a war they don't understand. So many of them tried deserting, they tried escaping, but they had no idea how far uh, India was from, uh, was from France. You know, they, they, they spent like a month in a ship, and then they landed in France. So they, they, they're not really sure of the distances. So in this story, what I kind of, and the, many of them were employed in digging trenches and so on. So w what I've used, the, the, the point that I've kind of used to connect it is I've kind of you know, stated that maybe they kind of find a tunnel when they're digging a trench, and they somehow think if they, find, if they follow this tunnel, it'll, it'll go all the way back to Hyderabad, maybe under Golconda or under Chaminar, where the many tunnels are supposed to be. So, and they kind of enter that, and then it's an adventure story, and then what happens to these soldiers is basically what the book is about. Yeah, so let's try this live drawing. So I've made some notes, but... Uh
but yeah, but this is like, it changes each time. So you can't really, uh, you know, you can't really recapture. I mean, you can't plan for it. It just happens. So, uh, so you know, you can't really go with a prepared script or something like that. So one of the things which I was, uh, so this is something, this project began between the German center in Hyderabad and the cultural ministry of Hamburg. So they wanted to uh, find a way, a kind of a project in which it would take a writer from Hyderabad and an artist from Hamburg and kind of uh, make it work. Something like an arranged marriage. But arranged marriage actually worked because I had never met Fabian before and he had never met me. So we didn't have it. <laughs> yeah, that's a good, good point. So I, so I wasn't sure. So it kind of, the kind of story kind of evolved because uh, they were good enough to send me to Hamburg for about a month. So I spent a month there and Fabian showed me, uh, you know, his, his city, he showed me the way he looks at it and so on. So this story was very much, uh, you know, inspired by that trip to Hamburg and, you know, the way he showed the city to me. So one of the things, uh, well, uh, there are many things that struck me. Uh, one of the things is that I, I love to walk, but uh, walking in Hyderabad is, you know, is absolutely harmful to your health. They should have those statutory warnings. If you're not run over, you'll fall into one of those construction pits or, you know, some piece of construction from the metro will fall on you or something. So they're like multiple threats from all directions. But in Germany, it's completely different. There, the pedestrian is king. And everything has been designed to make cities as, you know, walkable as possible. I think it's said, right? Uh, a rich country is not where the rich have cars. It's where the rich use public transport. And that's very much true in uh, Germany, and hopefully that will happen in India as well. And uh, you know, the the other thing which I found very peculiar is that uh, there everybody goes in cycles. Like Fabian also, you know, he was cycling everywhere. So I thought maybe he doesn't know how to drive a car or something. But actually, it turned out he does know how to drive a car, and he can drive a car. So he actually chooses to cycle, you know, out of his own free will, which was very surprising. Because in India, if you can own a car, you you buy a car and you drive a car. You don't go around in cycles. Uh, but there it's incredibly convenient uh, you know to cycle everywhere the cycling the you know cycle paths all of that well in india if you have uh, you know even if you have a cycle and you try uh, you know you will be an endangered species for sure and uh, here the you know the law of the jungle is very clear and they have very clear duties sorry so the here the the motorist uh, wants to I mean, the law is very simple. The motorists try to kill the pedestrians, and the pedestrians try not to be killed. So, you know, it's a very simple, clear equation. But in Germany, it's very different. Like, you know, so I was very suspicious in the beginning. Was it like a trap? Do they want me to walk on the roads, you know, very freely, and then they'll suddenly run me over? But no, it was, it worked. So one of the things, yeah, so you, the idea of this, you know, that you become an endangered uh, uh, animal if, if you go around walking and all that, in India, well, that was a huge relief for me in Germany. So that, that's, I would frankly say it was not you know, the architecture or the quality of life in general. It was just this freedom there that uh, unfortunately we have lost, which was there even here, but we've lost it. So that is the one thing. Now, the other thing, again, uh, connected with this in, in one way, was that uh, at least I came from, a, or, you know, I come from a generation where at least my parents uh, or my parents' generation it was very clear that the future was represented by the West. So people would go abroad, and then they would come back and you know, drink Coke cans or Kit Kat or something, and they would tell you this is how it's going to be in the future. So you think, aha, uh -huh. so it's like time travel. You go to the West, and you are seeing what India will be like in 20 years or 10 years or whatever it is. So that was how it was. And in my own, I mean, you know, in the, I went to college in, in, in the West, and I came back and so on. In my own time, I could clearly see that has changed. It has changed quite irreversibly. And in fact, now it's very obvious that China and India are like the future. That's the wave of the future. You know, the, the whatever you call the civilizational energy of the future is very much in uh, China and India. And people look here for inspiration. And in, in converse, what happened in, um, in Germany is that actually you can there, you can hide from the future, or you can be protected from the future. For example, one thing in India is that uh, you can't go anywhere with, without smartphones now. Uh, in fact, the poorer you are, the more you need smartphones. If you're quite rich, then maybe you can get away with it. 
but definitely you need smartphones. While in uh, in uh, in Germany, like you know, I I met Fabian and I met a lot of artists uh, in artist circles uh, through him, and I could see that almost very few of them had smartphones. They all use very simple burner phones. You know, I would say I'll WhatsApp you, and they're like, no, you can't WhatsApp me. But I would say I'll Skype you, and they're like, no, you can't Skype me. Or, or I'll Instagram you, like, no, you can't do anything of those things. So you can actually uh, hide from the future. And you can, well, hide is too strong a word. You could say you're protected from the future. You don't have to go with this, you know, irreversible wave into the future. So that I found very interesting, that here the, the smartphone is seen like a, this magic carpet which takes you everywhere, while there it's seen like a, you know, like a, like a cage or something, something which, can, which will inhibit you. So that was one of the very, you know, interesting thing I saw. So the other thing which I found very interesting was I was in this part of Hamburg, which is I thought was very commercial and so on. But right in the middle of this uh, uh, street, I could see this building, an old building, completely covered with uh, graffiti. Uh, so I asked Fabian, and he said that's something called the the road flora, the red uh, red flora, uh, or the the red uh, opera house. It was an old opera house which the government wanted to have it demolished and redeveloped. So in India, you would build some commercial complex or something. But there, they were like nothing doing. So all these anarchists, communists, whatever, all kinds of people, they took control of that building and they used it as a cultural center. And in fact, it's the one of its kind, it's one of the oldest. It's been in Germany for more than 30 years. The government has now kind of given up. It periodically tries taking control, but it, it, it has never has. And there's a kind of a commune or there's a sort of a collective organization in that building which kind of, um, uh, you know, which runs the show. So this is very interesting. This is, I thought, okay, cities here is something which is, okay, this is not just about the, you know, the, the highways or the malls or whatever. It's also cities as centers of resistance. Resistance to what you all know has been happening in this country. So you can, so cities, because they bring about this sort of a critical mass of thinkers, students, people who care about the future, you can kind of, you, you, there is this kind of unity. And even if the media is completely against you or whatever it is, the, you know, the official narrative is against you, because you can meet these people, because you can see them, you can resist, which is something which is only possible in a city. And, uh, and mind you, this has been very well known. For example, in the 1850s, in the 1860s, Paris was redeveloped by this architect or well, by an administrator called Baron Hausmann. And one of the key things, because Paris had lots of these protests, people kept protesting and there were a lot of revolt against the king. Uh, one of the things that Hausmann realized was that you have to have extremely wide boulevards. You don't want narrow streets leading into the public area of the city because people, crowds will suddenly gather. They'll come from the slums, they'll come from wherever. Uh, and they'll all sort of like river leading into the sea, they'll all come and turn up in the middle of the city, which is something which you don't want. What you do instead is you build these extremely wide boulevards where, you know, small units of uh, armed soldiers or the police can stop anybody coming. They can fire and you can't cross these boulevards. And the other thing is when you walk on this huge boulevard, you feel very much alone. You think you're, you know, you're, you're not part of this larger collective or this crowd or whatever. So that it isolates you, this magnificent architecture reduces your scale and says that you're insignificant, you're nothing, you can't do anything. So that was one of the, you know, the ideas behind building these beautiful and magnificent cities, but the idea also is crowd control. Now, the thing is, uh, the other way interesting thing I found in that, uh, uh, in that same, the road flora, there were all these signboards uh, saying, this is an anti-fascist zone. So I was like, wow, what's, what's this? So apparently the people who control the, you know, that community, they, they had them on all the streets leading to that area. That this, is, this is the place where, you know, fascists are not allowed. So I thought, okay, that's great. But, you know, why let it stick to that one street? It should, that, that zone should spread. And the zone should spread throughout, you know, that street, that city. And who knows, the whole country and maybe the world. Thank you. Would you like to say something about your drawing? Though I see the India map is incorrect. You've chopped off the Gujarat, and Amita Desai would be very upset about it. Well, it was an illustration to what Jai was talking about. So it's the endangered species on the bicycle. It's the smartphone going into the future. It is Hausmann with the 
Arc de Triomphe and the cannons, and it's uh, the anti-fascist zone of India. 